In the beginning, long before automobiles and gasoline engines, there was public transportation. Yes, even in a budding Salt Lake City in the late 1800s, mankind pleasured in the environmentally sound methods of travel. Indeed, it was a major draw for settling in the area as well. The Salt Lake Railway Company offered mule and horse-drawn trolley rides, an extensive transportation system most dense in the avenues and downtown areas of Salt Lake City by 1872. The gasoline trolley passed by Salt Lake City for the most part, but the trolleys in Utah had become electric by 1889. With the creation of the Salt Lake Rapid Transit Company in 1890, companies competed fiercely in public transportation until merging in 1903. In 1908, Union Pacific Railroad magnate E.H. Harriman turned the state fairgrounds into the site for an innovative trolley system. At one time, more than 140 trolleys operated from the barns of Trolley Square. It seemed as if public transit could only grow and become more effective. But not everyone was pleased with the situation. Enter General Motors. Electric rail lines could only hurt automobile, bus, and gasoline sales, but the lines would not go up for sale so long as they were partnered with the electric companies that maintained them. GM couldn't force the utilities to sell their transit lines, but the federal government surely could. The Public Utility Holding Company Act of 1935 essentially stripped transit lines away from their utilities, forcing them out on their own to live or die. All over the country, a large number of transit companies were now on the market. General Motors seized this opportunity, forming national city lines with the help of companies such as Chevron and Philips, buying out more than 100 electric streetcar systems in 45 cities, including Salt Lake City. General Motors proceeded to dismantle the lines, destroying tracks and burning trolleys. In Salt Lake City, the lines were discontinued and removed by 1945. Automobile and bus sales went up, and General Motors reaped the benefits. The government was not left uninformed of this scheme, however. In 1946, E.J. Quinby submitted a 36-page report. It began, This is an urgent warning to each and every one of you that there is a careful, deliberately planned campaign to swindle you out of your most important and valuable public utilities, your electric railway system. In this report, he delineated how national city lines bought transit companies and deliberately replaced streetcars and trolleys with GM diesel buses. His arguments went on to detail how streetcars and rapid transit were preferable to buses. Quinby stated, You will realize too late that the electric railway is unquestionably more comfortable, more reliable, safer, and cheaper to use than the bus system. But what can you do about it once you have permitted the tracks to be torn up? Who do you think you can find to finance another deluxe transit system for your city? Quinby's charges would eventually stir the government to press charges on GM, but they were not convicted for ripping out streetcar lines. Rather, they were convicted for controlling these companies to monopolize sales, a violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act. The participants were fined $5,000 and the senior executives fined $1. With the growth of cars came the growth of interstates, dooming interurban electric railways. The outstanding Bamberger railway system between Salt Lake City and Ogden with its high-speed Brill cars fell in 1952. The United States government, state agencies, and local communities allowed these systems to fail. In the District of Columbia, Congress ordered the elimination of streetcars over the strong objections of the local owners and managers. The government was doing its part. So let's not forget the words of Charlie Wilson when asked if there was a conflict with his former employer, GM, on his possible appointment to Secretary of Defense in 1953. He replied, I cannot conceive of one, because for years I thought what was good for our country was good for General Motors, and vice versa. Clearly, GM waged a war on electric traction. It was indeed an all-out assault, but by no means the single reason for the failure of rapid transit. Also, it is just as clear that actions and inactions by the government contributed significantly to the elimination of electric traction. This was good for GM, but not particularly good for our country. E.J. Quinby and the rapid transit companies lost the war when it mattered, and now Quinby's 1946 prophetic question has come back to haunt us. Who will we build them for you? Side of
Let's go.